Well, welcome, 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 everybody. Good to see all of you joining in. The numbers are going up. Awesome, awesome. And you may notice that tonight we have some guests with us. So I am so excited to introduce two people that I've gotten to know over the last, uh, one of them over the last year, and one of them for a lot longer. <laughs> but... Um, Margaret and Radhika, thank you for both being here tonight. And I think it's it's an important night to to kick off our first of our Wednesday night webinars in our OCD Awareness Month. And we've got the OCD conference later this week, and we had the OCD walk starts last month, and they're still going on this month. And we have just all sorts of great stuff going on. And so how important it is to to talk about OCD and tonight's focus is going to be on OCD and substance use because we have two people here tonight who are going to talk about um, the effects, the unfortunate effects of utilizing substances as a way to help manage OCD and, and uh, see substance use as a safety seeking behavior. And we'll get to some of your questions as well too tonight as well. We'll kind of mix in some of those things, but I would, I would first love to introduce to you uh, Margaret Sisson and Radhika. So uh, could both of you spend a moment maybe just to introduce yourselves and who you are and, and why you're here tonight? <laughs> Margaret, you want to go first? And then I <laughs> sure. Um, I'm Margaret Sisson. I'm executive director of Riley's Wish Foundation, which I named after my son, Riley Sisson, who struggled with OCD and substance use. And uh, I've been fortunate to know Patrick for a long time. And he has been a great support and good friend and understands a lot of what I've gone through and, and helps to share these stories that um, we hope we can help some people. And my name is Radhika Subramakrishna, and I lost my son Nandan six years ago to OCD. Um, and he was struggling with that uh, for several years and, um, you know, started experimenting, started self-medicating in different ways and uh, finally um, died because of that. And um, so I've, I've come to know Patrick over the last year. And, uh, you know, all these years, it's been a bit of a struggle to speak about it. But today I wanted to, to be here to kind of share the story and also uh, in the hope that uh, it will help others um, who are struggling with OCD. Both of you had sons who struggled with OCD who turned to substances as a way to help manage their OCD. Margaret, you talked to me once, I remember a, a very a very great car ride you and I had where we, we really, for the first time, really got to know each other's story, which was, which was wonderful. But you talked about the first time that Riley drank and what he described for a few hours about how his mind was quiet and and relieved i wondered if you could kind of share that story with everybody just as the way that riley kind of started to get into utilizing substances as the way to medicate himself for his ocd yes um riley told me this um when riley was in recovery and it was kind of a vicious cycle of, of always dealing with the ocd but in and out of recovery from substance use and he said the first time he drank was a like a light bulb that he thought ah oh, this is the answer this is gonna this stops my brain and so subsequently 
even as he went off to college. It wasn't so much socially that he would want to use substances um, for starting with alcohol, but it stopped his brain from those horrible thoughts. And, um, and I know Rodica, which will, will, we, ha we have spoken and, and have some similar um, stories and, and Riley always said, um, once he started, he couldn't stop. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't that, oh, well, he'd say, oh, yeah, the one day I'd say, oh, I just have one. And then the next day it'd be 50. And he couldn't stop. And um, But it did. It shut off his brain. It stopped those thoughts. So it, to him, as and in recovery, he'd say, I understand it makes sense for people because who wouldn't want to stop that? And then when he, but he realized that was not the way that he could survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Radhika, for your, did you hear anything from Landon about, you know, what he, how he felt when he was using versus when he wasn't? Yeah, no, I think it kind of, I would agree with Margaret. I think he had similar kind of thoughts. And of course, you know, being a chemistry major, he was experimenting with a whole lot of other things as well. Kept trying to get be one step ahead. And frankly, it's, um, yeah, I, I think for him, he didn't feel that the treatments he was, you know, the, and in those days, I guess six years ago, there were not that many options or we, he was, we were not aware and he was just on um, medication that, he didn't feel was necessarily uh, bringing him relief so he this he felt that this uh you know whether whatever he tried you know whether it was alcohol or anything else brought him tremendous i mean just like uh margaret said it kind of helped to shut down things in the brain you know for him because otherwise it was constantly like things his brain was like you know like one of those things on a wheel right constantly mm -hmm going round and round and round. The, the hamster wheel of hell, as I like yes, to refer yes, to it at times. Yeah. That's right. So that's how he felt without um, trying these things, you know. So he just, he needed, uh, he just did this to help himself. Yeah. Yeah. Justin says, I have a comorbid OCD and substance use addiction. What do you think is the best approach for tackling such a situation? Are you opposed to prescription medication? Well, we are definitely not opposed to prescription medication. We know that there can be medications that help people to prevent relapses. There can be medications that help people stop cravings. There can be medications that people take like antabuse that if you drink alcohol, it make you sick. <laughs> and there can be medications that can even block the ability of opioids to give you any kind of a high as well too, like Vivitrol or something of that nature. So uh, we, we, I think all would be in agreement on this panel that uh, bringing in a psychiatrist, discussing what a thorough treatment plan would look like from a therapy point of view, a medication point of view would be as well, it, it, or how you would add that as well would be, would be a very wise thing to do. Do you, either of you want to add something to that? So. Uh, can I add to that? Um, yeah. And and Patrick, we've talked about this often. And this was Riley's. Um, they would, uh, from the beginning, give him clonopin, yeah. which would trigger his addictive cravings. Mm -hmm. And and that happened from the time he was a teenager and ended up, I mean, that was the last what happened when when uh, we lost him is he, a doctor started him back on clonopin to ease his anxiety with his OCD. And in turn, that would trigger his substance use. And then he, I mean, he became into the, into the substance use cravings that he couldn't stop. Right. I'm, I'm certainly, he, uh, you know, he was on medications, you know, an SSRI, and certainly believe in in that. Um, if if someone struggles with an addiction, um, they need to be very careful about the benzos. Correct. Um, yes. So, mm -hmm. yeah. 
And I can just add that I think with Nandan, um, he was being given Zoloft for the, uh, you know, for the OCD. However, he never felt that it was uh, sufficient. You know, half the problem when he started self-medicating was he f he didn't feel like that was uh, effective. And uh, I don't believe there's been a new medication on the market for the last 30 years or so. So he was still, uh, you know, and every time we tried a different medication, it would um, have other side effects. He would feel very sleepy and he didn't want to feel that way. So I think there's a, um, I mean, I'm not a, opposed to medication, but I think a prescription medication, in fact, I support it, but I wish there were something which could be much more effective, you know, which would yeah. work really well. Yeah. Well, Margaret, I'm glad you brought up the, the issue of benzodiazepines, because those are definitely one of the medications that we talk about can be interfering with therapy and, mm -hmm. and don't really help. And then, as you said, can be quite triggering potentially for somebody who does have a substance use history, that it could restart that whole process again if somebody has, has gotten sober. So that's, that's always a class of medications that I think you really got to take a second look at before you would kind yeah, of and, and my thought just the the doctors need to be aware and and it's the, it goes mm -hmm. back to that honesty with your client and understanding and if you have OCD um, you can also talk to them about substance use and if that's the case the doctor can be aware of that and um, and then uh, you know some people you know, who struggle with OCD, a benzo is okay for them. But most type, if someone struggles with the substance use, yeah. um, then it's not going to be, it's not going to help. Yeah. Um, here's another side that's interesting. And maybe you've heard of this, especially through the foundation, Margaret, but Casey says OCD was triggered by a bad experience with substance use. And you think the event itself was quite traumatic and how would this be addressed in therapy along with ERP? You know, I see this a lot where people will come in and say, I was doing fine and then I decided to try marijuana or some other drug and and I just had, had a bad trip or experience on it and it really freaked me out and now I can't stop thinking about it or it's triggered these other things. So I think for anybody who would be considering going toward one of these types of, of drugs, as, as a way to self-medicate to recognize that it could also make things worse for some people as well. It could actually enhance the OCD experience if if it turns out to be kind of a bad trip or something like that. Yeah, I think that's very true. And, and, and I'll tell you the story of Riley with substance. He became, that became an obsession. Mm -hmm. The substance use became an obsession um, and would trigger all different things. So, um, it, and, and it's a very fine line of, of, um, and that, of what you, what you're dealing with and, and to have a good doctor that can recognize both. And, yeah. and so whether it be, you know, what medication, obviously the right therapy, because we went through years with, and, and I attribute that a lot the wrong mm -hmm. therapy for so long that Riley said, you know, he, then it just became desperate. And so, well, alcohol work, cause he would, he felt he was never going to get better because he wasn't getting the right therapy. So. Yeah. And I agree. I think treating them together is really important because even for Nandan, it was always like treating one or the other, but never the two together, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's hard. And boy, that that very thing led uh, me and, and my previous life to open up the Foglia Family Foundation Residential Treatment Center, where we treated both OCD and substance use together. And Margaret, I know our discussions were very influential on that as well. And you have, through your foundation sent some people our way and and uh you know it finally there's a place now where if you struggle with both ocd and addiction you can be treated for both at the same time and you don't have to go one place to work on one while you're suffering with the other one because nobody's dealing with it and they've just taken away the coping strategy i mean i always thought um i 
right? Like I didn't know Landon, uh, obviously, but you know, it's when you get somebody to stop their substances, but you're not working on their OCD at the same yeah. time, you've said, we're taking your greatest coping strategy that you've been utilizing away from you. And you got to suffer with this other thing until you get this coping strategy under control. Yeah. And then we'll treat you for the other thing that led you to use that coping strategy in the first place. Right. Yeah, and that's exactly, I think, what happened because at the time we actually asked a number of, you know, once it had become SUD, we had asked, uh, try to get tre treatment for both. But we were told first you have to deal with SUD, then you then we will afterwards deal with the OCD, you know. So it was, uh, and he, unfortunately, he didn't last that long, you know, died before that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And both of you now spend time, and, and thank you, by the way, both of you spend time speaking and and um, making sure that other families know and aware of this. So, what what do both of you feel is is just an important message to get out there? What what have people missed? You know, I I think you both of you have heard me say in various places like. First, we have to start in graduate school. We have to make sure that substance abuse courses are necessary, right? I, yeah. I got a doctorate degree in psychology and I, I audited a substance abuse course from another graduate program because we didn't have one in the psychology department, right? And, and I look back at that now and think, we missed that. You know, that uh, it was me and one other student that audited in my year, nobody else did. So how many people have graduated with doctorate degrees in psychology and didn't take a substance use class. We took a we took a uh, mental health you know disorders class where we we basically skipped the substance use uh, section and and we're told well that, you know they treat themselves and they have their groups and everything and that's what they do. You're probably not going to see much of that or help them. But here's here's the other disorders and this is what you could do and and it missed out on the comorbidity issue yes. that we see so very often. So. You know, this is your mountaintop and, and you can now shout from a mountaintop for a little bit to the people listening or who will watch this on a recording. What do you want people to know? Um, I, I will say, and Patrick, we've often discussed this, um, A, now the, the importance that we have a place that treats both OCD and, and substance use and that I think it's pretty, I don't want to say simple, but that doctors, uh, whether it be a therapist or a doctor, each one has the understanding they don't have to be, they don't have to treat substance use, they don't have to be an expert, but to know, and I, and I think there's some basic questions that with your, with your client that you can talk to to understand that and, and have that empathy that, you know, I'll be honest, Riley would lie because there was such a stigma to it. Yes. And he was so desperate to get help with OCD. And they'd say, well, you know, if you're, are you, you know, are you using something? And if so, you, you won't be able to get in our program. Well, so what, what do you do? You say, oh, no, you know, I, I don't do that on a scale from one to 10, you know. And so it, you're I think it will we are foolish to think that people are not going to uh, self-medicate. Um, we know how torturous OCD is. We know that if you're not even in. And hopefully now, I mean, I went through so many years and without with the incorrect uh that riley had the wrong uh, therapy but now i think we're you know we're making huge strides with that and but to also understand that many many people struggle with substance use and to be have some empathy and understand it and say i mean to me that's that simple thing is when if if you go into a therapist and you're struggling with both and even if that therapist doesn't isn't an expert, just to say, "Hey, we'll get you help." I, I've got I've got some good people that understand, and we're and we're all going to work together, and we're gonna we're gonna help you. 
I mean, that that's the simple part that I talk about. And, um, and there is hope compared to what, you know, years ago when Riley was diagnosed and what we went through, things have so much improved. Um, I think there's still room, lots of room for improvement. And I think that goes back to Patrick, what you were talking about is people in med school or going through masters in psychology that they understand mental health and substance use. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, no, I would echo all that Margaret said, you know, I totally agree. I think at the time, you know, when Nandan died, um, every, you know, also, I would say that there's a stigma, right? Of, first of all, mental health, uh, talking about that openly. So I think nobody should have that. This is as much, uh, you know, a condition or disease as anything else. You know, like if you have di uh, diabetes or anything else, you would talk about it. So it's important to kind of share what you're going through. And for the therapists and psychiatrists, etc., to know that there are treatments that can work on both together um, so that that way you're not just getting one thing treated um, and um, and ignoring the other one. The other thing I also want to say is for, especially with Nandan, I felt that, um, you know, when he went to, um, he died at the age of 19. So he was in um, undergrad uh, program. And the problem is uh, once you're above 18, the parents are not involved. And so colleges, I feel, have to do a better job of recognizing this and providing support because in a way they shut the parents off. So, but they are not doing enough. So your child is out there figuring out. And I feel like that could happen with Nandan that he was in, um, you know, of course, uh, under tremendous stress because of um, the college, you know, and the courses. And the stress brought on, I feel, the the SUD component, because till then we were dealing more with the OCD. I, I mean, I don't want to guess how all this happened, but um, there wasn't that much support from the college. And I feel like these colleges have to be aware that people, children are walking in and uh, with potentially these conditions and they have to be able to offer support or at least direct them to the right thing. And, um, you know, that was not given to Nandan. Yeah, it's interesting. I was actually just doing a uh, talk this morning to a university about uh, no CD partnering with them to to help them out with with these types of cases because uh, and most college counseling centers have a lot of generalist therapists, which yeah. is great, right? But we know that a general talk therapy, as both of you described, isn't really going to be the thing that's going to be very helpful to OCD. So finding that specialist and linking up with them to really help people who have these types of conditions get the help that's best for them is really what's necessary and where we want to go. And, and I'll put a plug for the collegiate recovery programs. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Riley, I think that kept him alive for a long time and he transferred to Kennesaw State University um, outside of Atlanta and they had therapists too. I'm not sure how skilled they were about OCD, but they had therapists, but the substance use um, program and how to help a student who wants to get, you know, their education, it was a super supportive, you know, unbelievably how they support these students through this. And I think every, I think every college needs that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, shout out to the moms. Uh, this has been very helpful. My little girl is 10, has OCD and anxiety, and I've taken upon myself to learn CBT to help her. Listening to the moms and their stories helps so much. So thank you both for, for, for that. Obviously, um, not always an easy topic to discuss, but uh, you know, I, I wanted to honor Landon and. Riley and start off our OCD Awareness Week with, with them as much as I could. So uh, that's why I was happy to have both of you here today. A reminder to everyone listening, tonight's webinar brought to you by NoCD. NoCD, a downloadable app you can get through Google Play or iOS, and you can reach out to NoCD for a free 15-minute call to see if NoCD therapy might be helpful for you. We have therapists all over the country, and we are expanding across the world as well, too. So please reach out to us at nocd.com. Uh, 
advocacy has been a big part then for, for both of you. Uh, you know, Riley's Wish Foundation, can you tell us a little bit about that, uh, Margaret, and what your hopes are with, with, with the Riley's Wish Foundation? Uh, yeah, a little, uh, honestly, when I started Riley's Wish, it was, I think, save me. It was mm -hmm. my, uh, and it has evolved, and I have people, a great board, and we started the Riley Wish Lectureship, which Patrick was one of my first I might have, I might have been on that a few times. You might though. have been on that, <laughs> yeah. And, um, and so now that's, you know, our mission is to raise awareness, educate, and offer resources for um, those who suffer with OCD, substance, substance use, and also their families. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Radhika, you've been yeah. doing some work too, so. Yes, I have. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I don't have a foundation. I really uh, admire Margaret for starting that. I think for me, one of the things was, um, you know, the same mental health um, stigma, I guess, of not talking about this too much. And then I realized I should kind of talk, I should spread awareness about this. So one thing I've been doing is uh, his uh, school college was UC Berkeley. And so actually um, I've, been work I've been working with them to kind of raise awareness of all of this. And I actually had Patrick um, and all of us, we gave a presentation there and it I think it was a bit eye-opening for them because they had not thought of, of this at all. So I think that was very helpful to, uh, to kind of share the story with them as well as kind of raise awareness of OCD and SUD and um, all of that. So I think that that happened last year. So I'm trying to continue to raise awareness in these ways. The other thing I'm doing is actually also partnering with um, the OCD research group at Stanford. So I have um, given them, a, a talk to them a few times um, over the last couple of years, sharing Nandan's story there. And hopefully um, that inspires, uh, you know, the group there to not just think of, uh, us, uh, you know, patients like Nandan, uh, Riley, etc., as just uh, data points, right? We are actual human beings with stories behind us. So I think that helps to kind of personalize uh, what they are trying to do in terms of research. So, um, and I will be continuing to partner with um, Dr. Rodriguez there, um, you know, in the OCD um, a conference or something that she has coming up. So there are different ways that I will be sharing uh, Nandan's story so that it helps other people. I'd also like to ask both of you just on the safety behavior thing um, of just being in a family of someone who has OCD and would like to maybe, you know, hear from you on that. Like uh, we have a a statement here from Crop who says, I try not to do a compulsion, but I can't resist it. I try to say maybe or maybe not, but I just can't resist doing the compulsions. When, when you know, your kids were growing up and you're, you see them doing compulsions, that how did, you, how did you kind of get sucked into the, the OCD uh, at first? And, and when did you maybe kind of learn that those those immediately gratifying reassurances or helping to avoid were, weren't actually being a helpful thing. And was, was there kind of a light bulb moment to, to any of that for either of you as well? I go first. Uh, okay, you go first, Margaret. Yeah. Um, I, that is a mother's first instinct is to reassure your child. And, yeah. and, I was the best one at it. <laughs> um, and not really until I learned about ERP did I really understand that. Mm -hmm. And I learned more about the language, um, how to when and Riley was a master of, of trying to get reassurance. And I had to, I mean, it was, it was learning that language that I could help him and I wasn't reassuring, but, but if you're out there and you're a mom and you've been reassuring, we will love to help you, but don't, 
don't beat yourself up because that that's your that's your natural thing. You want you don't want to see your child suffer, and that's so many parents watch, and it's it's tragic to watch, and you want to reassure. But um, I know both of us, all of us, would if you want to reach out, we can yes. help with that. Um, and there's a lot of great resources and books to read to kind of help you just with the language, which is which is helpful. <clears throat> Yeah, I think we went through those periods too, you know, I think um, for us, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we we kept anything that he showed, like his, uh, he kept washing his hands and, you know, constantly. And we, uh, you know, we didn't, I think it took us a while to figure out that there was, you know, uh, an issue, right? Or that he required um, that it's better to get treatment. So I think he, it took us some time. And I think in during that time, we of course were doing everything to reassure him, but we didn't uh, really take the first step of actually seeking help, you know? And so I think uh, it's, it's, we, we are happy to talk, uh, you know, to anyone who wants to reach out uh, just to kind of help, uh, you know, we've all, we've been there, right? And, uh, so we can talk about the details even more and uh, kind of help out in whatever way um, to kind of go see how to navigate that period, right? And uh, get to a point where you can actually start, uh, you know, get meaningful, start getting therapy for the for the, for your child. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things that is on there too, and maybe you both heard this, Crappie says, where I can't resist trying. Uh, or, or uh, I can't resist the compulsion, and I can't not do something. And and uh, that's a that's such a word for me when when people say that they can't do something. I I I try to let them know that if you can't do it, then there's no therapy that's going to be helpful to you, and there's there's no medication that's going to be helpful. It's uh, I would contend from from an OCD and anxiety kind of standpoint, it's not that you can't do things; it's that you won't do things. And I don't mean won't in the sense that you're a bad person because you won't do it. I mean it in the sense that you've decided maybe that the immediate gratification of the safety behavior is more important than sitting with the discomfort of the of the obsession and learning that you can handle it in the long run. And, and when you make that shift to, I've decided that no matter what my brain tells me, I'm not going to believe it to be true. I'm going to sit with it and learn that you can handle that then you start to make some of the changes and you go from now will I or won't I sit with this versus I can or I can't sit with it. Yeah, and I, I think OCD is a family, let's say a family disease. Well, tell me more about that because that is, I was going to get there anyway, so I'm glad you uh, Well, <laughs> Let's I, talk I, about that. <laughs> it is, it affects siblings, parents, grandparents, everybody, because if, if someone is, is, um, that reassurance, they'll go to any family member. And, and that's where, as your family, if you could teach and, and support each other, that you're, so you're not reassuring and you have the right language and, and it, and it's the language, not Oh, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to reassure you or, you know, I don't, but, but in a sympathetic and have empathy for your, your child or your, whoever has the OCD that it's, I, I'm not going to reassure you because I love you and I want the best for you. So I'm here to help, but I can't reassure you. And, and I found Riley would go, Okay. Okay, mom. And we'd say, and he'd say, worst case scenario. And I said, yeah, worst case scenario, go there, figure that. What, what do you think? And, and he'd walk through that and he'd say, okay, okay, you're right. You're right. And, and it's hard. I mean, and, it, and I'll be honest, it's exhausting. It's an exhausting for a family member. And, mm -hmm. So that's where you're going to have to support each other in that, because um, it, it is, and, and and it's exhausting for a, a sibling. And what happens is they don't get 
the attention that they need. And that's, so it is a family, it's a family deal. And, and the more support you all can, if you're in a family and have a, someone suffering with OCD, the more you can support each other and really understand why you can't reassure, um, everyone will benefit from that. Yeah, no, I would agree. It is certainly a longish road, right? I mean, meaning that this is not going to be cured in one day, but you've got to have the patience. And I think to Margaret's point, you have to, you know, with Nandan, for example, when the therapist was giving him exercises to do um, at home, he would not, he would try to skip out of that, you know, it was easier to fall into the behavioral pattern rather than, I mean, it needs uh, that's, uh, you know, you have to force yourself to to do it. And I think that's where you can support whoever is going through the OCD at home to kind of make sure to give them that uh, environment so that you're supportive and you're not frustrated because it can be frustrating, certainly. You know, you want this to just go away very quickly. It's But it's, it is hard work on both the part of the patient as well as the family member. And certainly, you know, for us, um, Nandan has a younger sister who is, uh, you know, in her teen, uh, she was actually 15 when he died. So for us, it was difficult focusing on Nandan as well as the younger sister who is, you know, she was uh, more like, um, so he was diagnosed with OCD when he was 12 or 13, or let me see, um, actually more like 15. So she was 11. And so, you know, that's a critical period and so you've got to make sure that you're all supporting each other so um because this this is a long road but there is hope you know if you really follow through with the the treatment um and uh, and have a good the support of a good um uh, therapist uh, this can work but it's you've got to be ready to put in the work yes I always say it's a marathon. Yes. It's, um, it it's, doesn't change overnight and, yeah. um, and and it's a long, but you'll see wonderful benefits if, if and pretty neat to see when someone, um, someone gets better. Yeah. So bo both of your oldest sons had OCD and both of your youngest daughters were the siblings of, of that person. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's parents listening tonight or that are going to be listening to this recording. What advice do you have for them about the other sibling and how to how to help manage them? And and looking back now, obviously, you know, I, I say this all the time every decision we make appears to be the best decision to make at the time that we That's make it. Right. And only after making the decision, can we look back on it and decide if it was really great or not. Right. So, mm -hmm. so when people say to me, I made a horrible decision, I always say, well, no, you made, you made the decision at the time appeared to be the best decision to make. And that's why you made it. Right. So I'm, I don't, ever want to punish people or say you made a horrible or bad decision because at the time you make it, it's, it, it appeared to you to be the best thing to do. But yeah. obviously looking back is a different experience. So now that you have, you know, uh, the, that time to look back and, and there are families out there who are struggling with this and managing multiple children, one who has OCD, others who don't, what, yeah. what advice do you have for those families? You want me to go first? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah. I would say that uh, when I look back, right, I wish I had spent more time with my daughter. Of course, if you look at the bad part of it is I have the rest of my life with my daughter, you know, like uh, my son is gone. But then I would say the advice to everybody is don't just focus. I know it's easy to just focus on the child who has OCD to the exclusion of everything else. But the one advice is, yeah, make sure you're giving enough attention to the other children as well, because I know it's difficult to kind of uh, not think about OCD all the time. But uh, in my mind, I just wish that um, I had spent more time with my daughter, too, so that I could she, she could uh, that her whole world is not just surrounded by OCD. You know, that's one thing. The other thing is don't make OC, OCD. It's important to to work through it, make sure your son or your child is getting the right treatment. But at the same time, don't make every moment about OCD. You know, I think it's important to live your life too, 
to enjoy things there. and even with the person who has ocd they are able to do other things too uh, so you can kind of uh, try to in, you know enjoy and embrace life without just focusing only on that because uh, even for them you know it's uh, if they every moment they they are thinking that oh i have ocd and i have then that's also a very big thing to handle but i think that for me i wish that um i could have maybe if i had done things a bit differently i could have um, probably spent a little more time with my daughter as well during that time and um uh you know been uh, maybe more a little more patient with nandan too probably you know when uh, and uh, yeah yeah and i and patri say that i that's my one thing and that i can tell a parent um you can't go don't go back cuz you can yeah you'll beat yourself up sure no and, doubt yeah well absolutely absolutely yeah, you that's, gotta, that's, you that's, to go, always go forward and and you love your child and so the decisions you made I mean, i felt yeah. like i did everything i could yeah in that I knew how to do. And, um, um, and with, uh, a sibling, a daughter, um, she is loved, loved her brother and they were yes. best of friends. And she was in, uh, in college, just started college when we lost Riley and it was devastating. And, um, and do I look back at things? I mean, I felt like I did did the best I could with her, you know, yeah. not not even knowing what what all you were dealing with. Um, yeah. uh, it's that hindsight, and um, um, but I think um, I would, if you're a parent and you're listening to this, um, a don't beat yourself up. That's very sometimes important. this is hard. Uh, have a support. And, and whatever, whatever that looks like, um, have a support. I don't feel like I had support just because I didn't know and, and I felt pretty alone. And so I, I encourage you to have support. And now like on Facebook, there's OCD parents with children with OCD and gosh, I go on there and I answer questions for people and anybody can, ask a question and then lots of people come in and say, gosh, I get it. I understand. So it's just nice to have that support. Um, and I encourage if you're, if the, the sibling, whether they, what, if they struggle with anything yeah. or not, that they have support too. And, and as you're hearing this, um, did I know all that? No, I didn't. So yeah. I, that's something I, I share with you that you could just make sure because it's, you know, raising children is difficult anyway, yes. but it's hard with, you know, a child with OCD. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and again, a more personal topic and, and please, if it's, if I get too personal on a thing and you're not ready to answer things, that's fine. But you know, one thing that I don't know that we talk about is not only the effect of other children, but the effect that this has on a marriage as well, too. And and being a couple and what is, is there a fallout at times of having, uh, you know, not only a, a child who has as an issue uh, and and trying to find the right therapist and what if each parent has different ideas about how to help that child and or how they react to grief or loss or those types of things um, so i think i i've seen a few things in the feed even someone who said that they they're raising children one who has ocd and, and she's a single mom and how that's mm -hmm. even more exhausting for for if she's okay. she's feeling as well too so um yeah. Well, any ideas on that at all? Well, and I'll say that's where it comes in with the support and having a partner um, that support you support each other um, is going to be um, beneficial and helpful. And one, if one's doing it for a while, then they might need a break. So it's a, it's, it's really a, a 
partnership that will help um, will help each other, and because um, uh, it can be a it, it can be a different difficult. And then when you put the as rather you know when you add the substance use yep. uh, piece and you have that going on too, it it oh. can be pretty stressful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I would agree with you, and I think I was. I mean, you know lucky that with my husband i think we were aligned on many things i think so it was helpful but i would agree with what margaret said that i, I think one thing i did was when nandan's ocd was diagnosed um and you know it started dealing with all of that i also got some support for myself in terms of therapy so i think it's perfectly okay to kind of have an external source like your own therapist where you can talk about these things and that way you can get the support you need so you can provide in turn the support to your um, child so i think um so i you know have it's important that yeah your spouse and you are you know are aligned in a way so that you know, in terms of treatment options and all of that, you're not kind of thinking of different things. And of course, if there's an external therapist that you can go to as a couple to kind of get help through this, it is, uh, it's mm -hmm. as uh, Margaret said, it's it's not a sprint, right? It's, it's a marathon, it's going to be there. And so, you know, uh, it's good to get the help so that you, you don't, it doesn't get to a point where it's kind of really, uh, you know, too late to get help. So it's better that you recognize that, yeah, taking care of yourself as a parent mm -hmm. or, um, you know, is as important as taking care of the person with OCD. Certainly agree with that. That's, um, that's key. And I'm all about seeing a therapist to, to help you walk through things yeah. that, that support is, is key. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, I think that's, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I don't know that everybody's really good at that, right? We, yeah. we put so much energy into helping our loved one, which we yeah. feel maybe as a parent that that is our, op that is our thing. That is what we do. But at the same time, do we wear ourselves out doing mm -hmm. that as well too? And um, so, it is important to take breaks if possible. And and going back to that, you know, uh, our, the person who wrote there, a single parent, I think partner doesn't have to be romantic partner or marriage partner. Partner can be a trusted friend, a, a brother, a sister, a family member, um, uh, another family who has OCD in their family. And maybe maybe one time your child is, is with them and another time you, you give them a break. But to allow respite or something in those types of situations and, and care and and know that you can broaden that definition of partner beyond yes. just just being Absolutely. a marriage. That's mm -hmm. right. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and find something that, uh, you know, whether it be a hobby or yes. you know, Patrick laughs at me, my horses have been my, <laughs> my lifesaver. And, and Riley would say he knew when I was um, he was so in tune and he'd say, mom, I think you need go ride your horses. That's what you love. Go ride your horses. That makes you happy. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, yeah, I kind of think I need to do that. <laughs> and it's, you know, been a, a, a love of mine and I feel very fortunate that I have that, but yeah, find something because what happens is you become, that becomes your hobby is your child and helping and doctors yes. and all that. And that can be exhausting. So you got to have some self take self care mm -hmm. is, is important because you're not going to be able to last and be able to help your child. Um, or it might be your spouse or your, you're not going to have the energy if you don't take care of yourself. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. So, we have a place now, again, Foglia and, and Margaret, you know, when, when we were talking and I was excited to get that open, we have a place now that really looks at this co-occurring treatment for OCD and substance use. And I think, you know, my message has always been, I don't, I don't want people to, 
to have to feel like they have to choose one or the other, that they can go and there's a place mm -hmm. to get help where both can be addressed at the same time. And um, I, I hope it continues to be a game changer for people so that families who are dealing with OCD and substance use know that there's a place to go for help. And um, it, it was an honor to open you know, Foglia and to, to get that off the ground and running and that it's, even though I'm here at NoCD now, that it's still going and I'm, I'm proud of that fact that, that that is still available to people so that we can help out. Mm -hmm. um, let me see if there's any other questions or things that have come up. Um, Sarasota guy asked, do you have any tips on how to avoid compulsions? Well, uh, we'll, we'll throw that to the moms as well, too. But, uh, you know, the tip is uh, one of the easiest things to consider is to do the opposite of what the compulsion is, right? I mean, uh, I, uh, Margaret and Reddick, I think you'd agree, OCD doesn't care about anybody but itself. OCD doesn't yeah. care about the person who has OCD. Yeah. OCD doesn't care about the family of the people who have OCD. OCD doesn't care about the friends. OCD doesn't care about the horses or the dogs or anything like that. OCD cares about one thing and that's OCD. And I've, I've recently uh, joked a little bit. I've said OCD is like the koala of disorders because koalas eat one thing. They eat eucalyptus leaves. That's all that they eat. <laughs> They're not known to eat anything else other than eucalyptus leaves. Right. And, and, OCD eats one thing, and that's compulsions. And and you feed OCD by doing compulsions. And the more compulsions you do, the more you feed OCD, and therefore the worse OCD gets because you've done more compulsions. So uh, I always try to send the message out to people that uh, the best thing to do would be to do the very opposite of what your OCD wants you to do to feel good right there in the moment. But I, I'd love your opinions on that as well. Too. You want to go, Rich? Okay. You want to go first? Well, I, I can. I mean, it's a trick question. I mean, in the sense that <laughs> if it were that easy, then the therapist That's would right. be out of business, right? I mean, so I think for somebody who suffers from OCD, I, I would just say that try to get the right therapist. You know, I think that's really important. And then follow through with whatever. I think what Nandan struggled with was, yes, finding, first of all, a good therapist is not the easiest thing. But, you know, thanks to Patrick and, you know, got a lot of resources right right now compared to what was there many years ago. But then once you find the therapist, um, it is like doing homework. They will give you exercises. Like, for example, with Nandan, he had... Um, all, I mean, other than washing hands, he was struggling with, um, you know, he was afraid that he would drop, I know this sounds silly, but he was afraid that he would drop electronics on the floor. Mm -hmm. so that was one of his big fears. So the therapist made him actually walk around with a radio or something like that with his hand up like this, you know, and then walk around. That was his exercise, which he had to do at home. Great. So, you know, so we reminded him to do that at home. So this is there is work involved, you know, there's no easy solution. But at the same time, it's like receiving an assignment uh, from the therapist and working through it. And uh, there's no shortcut to that. Right. So I think that's what I would say that. Um, and then as you keep doing that, it does get better, you know. And then there was a time when I Nandan was very happy because he was actually able to carry this around without <laughs> fear, you know. So, <laughs> but uh, he had multiple other things also, you know, like he was afraid of a lot of things. But at least one by one, it was starting to get solved. So I think that's that's my advice that find the right therapist begin the program so that th that way you can help yourself. Yeah. And I think, and that's, you know, finding the right therapist is going to be really important to, and, and you can ask, that's your job is to ask those that, you know, know what to ask your thera the therapist. Yeah. And, um, and we don't have to go into all that, but there's, you know, yeah. Patrick, you probably have a whole list of what, oh. <laughs> you know, I got a few, I got a few ideas, maybe. Yes. And um, and and uh, and that is okay. And if they don't 
then you find somebody else because you, you find somebody this else. This is going to be somebody that's going to be really important in your life. Yeah. Right. I like what Love Lana says here about uh, just thanking you because we learn a lot from your stories and experiences because it gives us a different perspective than, you know, a lot of times this is a Q&A with me and they hear me chatting all the time, but, uh, you know, who wants to listen to me all the time? I mean, right. it's, it's so... <laughs> It's so nice to have other people here and other perspectives going. I know uh, later this month, we're going to have Kim Quinlan on as well, too. I know Margaret, a good friend of yours mm -hmm. as well, and mine. Uh, she's got a new book out, so we're going to be talking about that. So um, so that's that's uh, that's really exciting uh, yeah, that, that any, she'll be on with us as mom, well. If between the two of us, you know, go on my website, rileyswish.com, and my email's on there. I'll talk to you because I, I, I understand what's what's going on, and I'm be glad to be to get you to the right resources, whatever that is. Yeah. And and Patrick, if you want to share my email ID too, you can. Oh, sure, I I can. Uh, yeah, I can do that as well. I will yeah, share mine. Mm -hmm. I will uh, be happy. To do so, I put Riley's wish up there already, Margaret. So oh, okay. I did that. Good, good. And ready? Let me let me just pull up your email so that I can copy it, and I will put it right in there as well too. There it is. I'm just going to copy that. One moment. I'm like watching somebody copy and paste something. <laughs> <laughs> thrilling, thrilling podcasting right here. I know everybody. <laughs> All right, so I put uh, I put both of your contacts out there. Like, well, uh, I want to thank both of you for being here tonight and kicking off again our OCD Awareness Month with your stories about Landon and Riley and and. Uh, I wanted to give the two of you the last couple of minutes just to uh, say some final words about your sons. Uh, I know that it's unfortunate that their turning to substance use as a way to deal with their OCD ultimately led to us losing both of them and the world not having them in it. But uh, I'm, I'm glad that the two of you have have taken on a torch to make sure that no other families have to deal with this kind of issue and and that you put yourselves out there to talk about this and you're not shy about it and and you you don't sugarcoat it and uh, so thank you to both of you so I'll I'm going to let the two of you take us out tonight with what you want to say about uh, Landon and Riley and just what your hope is for everybody else. Well, I'll start. I, first I want to thank you Patrick for for asking us to do this cuz it's uh, it's an honor to be on here and it's an honor for me to be with another mom that understands. Um, I, uh, it's been seven years that I lost Riley and sometimes it feels like yesterday and, uh, and it's, you know, it is what it, it's, it's a difficult, it's very difficult but I have a feeling that the more we talk about this and the more we share that the less, the less young people will lose. And, um, uh, I'm, I'm proud of, of being a part of this and being a part of a group of people and advocates that we all want to help. And that means, means a lot to me call my OCD peeps and, and it's, it's pretty important in my life too. So thank you, Patrick, for letting, for allowing us to be on this, yeah. this podcast. Cause I feel like the more we're gonna, when we talk about it and I'm hoping I'll get emails and then if it's just one person, if it's just one person you help, it's, it's worth it. Yeah. I would echo everything that Margaret said. Thank you. First of all, Patrick, you know, I think, uh, it's great that uh, you hosted this because, uh, you know, I would, for me too, if I can, you know, Nandan is not going to come back, but I think he would be 
very proud of what I'm trying to do, um, you know, and, and to speak openly about this. And I think if, as Margaret said, if there's just one person I can help with the story, that I feel like I would have done my part. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank both of you and I want to thank everybody for listening tonight. And of course, you can reach out to Margaret at and, and Radhika, their, their contacts are in the chat there. So, um, and for those of you who messaged me through this, we just got another one. Thank you very much. I have a son with OCD that uses marijuana. So this was very helpful for me. So um, there's a lot of moms that are going to, we're here tonight or are going to watch this. And uh, I think it's going to allow them to recognize one thing too, that, uh, you know, we often, I, I think a lot of people think, oh, well, they have anxiety. They would never use a substance. I mean, that, that wouldn't happen. And don't be fooled. Right. Don't don't be fooled by that, that uh, it is important to ask the questions and to know what's going on in your kids' lives to make sure that uh, they don't go down the path of using substances as their as their safety behavior. Because while there are people out there that want to help and there are places now that will help, there are, yes. there are unfortunately people who have have lost the fight against that as well, too. So mm -hmm. I'm honored to have had both of you here with me tonight. I thank you so very much. And I thank all of you also for listening. Uh, it's, it's always great. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.